Nobody move a muscle. just heard here was uh, roars and growls of dinosaurs from the 2001 film Jurassic Park 3. And today with me, I have Douglas Quinn, the man who designed these roars and growls for the Hollywood blockbuster. Hello, Doug. Hey, good morning, Aiste. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you for joining me for this first episode of The Sound of Things. So how did that happen? One day you got a phone call from Universal Pictures and they asked, Please make our dinosaurs talk. Well, it's funny how these things work. So I never really had an ambition to become a film sound designer, but I had um, been working on a mix of some recordings that I made in Antarctica at Dolby Studios in San Francisco. And the door to the studio was open. The folks at Dolby were very gracious and allowed me to do a surround sound mix of some underwater recordings I had made of Waddell Seals in Antarctica. And the door just happened to be slightly open when a man named Richard Beggs walked by. Richard Beggs worked on the sound design for Apocalypse Now with Francis Ford Coppola back in the late 70s, early 80s. And he just popped his head in the door and said, what are you doing? Uh, Because the sounds of the Waddell Seals were pretty intriguing. And so I described to him, and he said, well, you know, a bunch of us from the sound design community here in the Bay Area get together periodically and just shoot ideas around and share listening. Would you be willing to, to talk to the group and to meet some people? I went, well, sure, of course I would. And in amongst them was a man named Chris Boys. And Chris Boys was at the time working on Titanic, And so we got to talking about underwater recording for that film. And so he kept me in mind and came back to me to work on Dinosaur to just provide some sound effects. And when he was tapped to do the uh, sound design for Jurassic Park 3, he gave me a call and said, hey, this would be a great opportunity for us to work together. And I know you've got this, you know, wonderful archives. Would you be interested? And I absolutely raised my hand and said, yes, it would be a great idea. So it's just one of those happenstance things that opened up a whole world of possibility for me. But it's basically because of Chris Boys, who was the supervising sound editor on the film, that I got involved. And then, you know, he uh, also involved me uh, on a very small scale for Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers, uh, to provide sound effects for that. So that's the background of how that came to pass. It was just, if the door to the studio had not been open, no one would have known I was in there and this would have never happened. Well, talk about perfect timing, right? Um, (laughs) But yeah, so my question is, so what they heard through those open doors were the sounds of, what kind of sounds, what kind of recordings? So I was recording underwater sounds of Waddell seals, which we'll get to in a later episode, Uh, but they're very unusual sounds and sound almost like synthesizers, or as one person commented from another film, that sounds like Pink Floyd music. So I think it had this sort of musical and mysterious quality that was just very intriguing. Um, and so the, the Antarctic material, not specifically the Weddell seals, but emperor penguins became part of the vocabulary of the velociraptors that we used in Jurassic Park 3. So it, it was the sort of beginning of an exploration of, of sounds that were the most unlikely combination to find their way into dinosaur vocalizations. Okay, let's, so let's talk about that a little bit. So now the, the, the clip that I've just played, uh, what kind of dinosaurs were that? And uh, what were those dinosaurs before they actually became dinosaurs? So the scene is um, basically a fight between a Spinosaurus and a T-Rex. And the T-Rex is known to, to folks who've seen the first and second Jurassic Park films. But the Spinosaurus is a new character in Jurassic Park 3, along with the Velociraptors. So we had a, a new cast of characters to work with. 
And the idea behind this big conflict, which comes early in the film, is that the Spinosaurus is a bigger, badder version of the T-Rex. And so Chris Boys gave us direction in the sound design process of coming up with a vocabulary that didn't necessarily draw from everything that was in the first two. He said it's real important that we acknowledge, you know, the legacy that we have in the franchise with the previous films, but that we don't keep going back to the same sounds. Uh, we need to freshen it up. So with the Spinosaurus, we looked, again, to large mammals, especially elephants and uh, large cats, so lions and tigers, jaguars. And I had done some recording in Kenya of lions and um, also elephants. And Chris had done some zoo recordings at the San Francisco Zoo. So we had a good collection of sounds and not just roars. We really wanted to have a, a broader palette to choose from uh, to, to be able to build these sounds out. So what you hear in the big fight between the Spinosaurus and the T-Rex, uh, spoiler alert, the Spinosaurus wins that battle. Uh, we had... Uh, an opportunity there to, again, broaden the vocabulary. So what you heard were a couple of elephant roars. Most people think of elephants as that classic trumpeting sound from an old Tarzan movie, which they do, but they have a much wider vocabulary and range of sounds, including these really deep, resonant roars. So maybe we can have a listen to a few of those. <laughs> So with the elephants anchoring it, we also, I used some lions roaring, territorial roaring. And the clip I'll share with you now is of two males, young males, roaring. And what we would do is not use the entire sound, but we would take parts of the sound and we'd blend them with the elephant sounds so that it was neither one nor the other, but became something else. And this is true with most of the dinosaur sounds, is that we use as a baseline, if you will, a particular vocalization. But then we change it around a little bit, move it up in pitch or down in pitch, stretch it out a little bit, maybe add just a little bit of lion to the elephant so that it becomes something else that fits with the drama of the picture as the audience experiences it. sounds very convenient you know you just happen to have those uh, recordings of I don't know lions elephants uh, what else vultures I heard yes so when we get to the velociraptors um, and we're introduced to them a little bit into the films there's a bit of suspense there because the um, characters talk about the velociraptors but the audience doesn't actually get to experience them to a little bit into the film the key thing with the velociraptors is their social intelligence. So that gave us, and that's part of the um, plot of the film, is that we're dealing with an adversary that isn't just big and roars a lot, but a species that can work in a very complicated social organization. And so the challenge for us as sound designers was how do we give that expression through sound? So absent them being able to talk, we had to think in terms of proto-language and what the tonal quality of those sounds were. It wasn't just screeching and roaring, that as they communicated with one another, a call for help or whatever the context was, that that would be an important part for the audience um, to experience as well in terms of the suspense involved, that part of you know the frightening aspect of these creatures was not just their big teeth and their claws, but the fact that they could act and work collectively and that they were quite an adversary in terms of that social dynamic. So with that in mind, we really listened to a lot of different sounds and the selection in the clip you know, that uh, we can have a little bit of a listen to today is towards the end of the film where the velociraptors are trying to get uh, some eggs back that were stolen from them. And so the contact calling is a combination of emperor penguins from Antarctica, white-backed vultures from Kenya, which at the time were everywhere but are now an endangered species, 
and some baboon territorial calls or, or barks that have a pretty chilling effect, particularly when they split the night. And in this case, it was um, male baboons who had sighted a leopard in a tree nearby. So this is an alarm call and a threat call. So what we could do is weave these together by paying attention to the tonalities and manipulating them so that there was a greater complexity and variety with the velociraptors than there were for the Spinosaurus or T-Rex, where really what we wanted from there was a big, scary, you know, roar sound. But the velociraptors is a lot more subtlety. And so that was what was fun to explore with that and to create this, this world of sound that is an expression of their intelligence and their ability to act as a group. Mm. Okay, so we'll listen to that scene of um, dinosaurs, um, and pardon, I didn't get the terms right, so I'm just going to call them generically dinosaurs. So we'll listen to that um, scene of communication among them um, a little bit. And to, just to remind um, our audiences that were penguins, vultures, and baboons, right? Yes, exactly. And then there are a few other things thrown in there. There's some wolverines. Um, so I was working with another sound designer who's a wildlife biologist in Alaska, Kathy Turco. So really it was uh, Chris Boys, Kathy Turco, and myself. And it was nice working in a group that way because we could meet and play things for one another and say, how does this appeal to you? How does this work? How is this sounding? Is this effective? And um, so, so the conversations were really interesting in terms of the kind of emotion that was being communicated through these sounds based just on their tonality and whether we were hitting the mark or not. So those are great conversations to have. Mm. So that's that's fascinating, and and what really strikes me in, in all of you know your <laughs> recountings of of this work process is uh, you mention all those scientists like you know biologists. So how important was that knowledge? Did you have any prior knowledge of dinosaurs and their um, their you know existence on this earth, and how important that knowledge was for um, you as a sound designer? That's a great question, and I, I think with every film. You have a different opportunity and um, different ways of thinking about your challenges as a sound designer. And I think the key success for sound design is that you don't want to draw attention to yourself by being too clever, and you certainly don't want to come up short. So the, the trick is to, to balance the sonic elements with the picture, to marry them effectively so that to the audience, they, they don't really notice it. They're so caught up in the story and in the action. So I think once you have that clear understanding, then it comes down to really getting the details right and you know, figuring out what the, the grammar, if you will, and the syntax of a given film is going to be. The goal here was to scare 10-year-olds. I think that's what we were aiming for, and we kept that on as a prize. But the background research is equally important. We wanted to know really what has been done about dinosaur vocalization. What do we in fact know? Because part of the story in Jurassic Park 3 relates to that, that the discovery in the fossil record shows that they had a complex vocal tract and resonant uh, cavity in their anatomy that led to speculation that maybe they could communicate in ways that we didn't understand. So we did look at some of the scientific literature to see well, what do we in fact know? And there wasn't a lot there to, to go from. There have been one or two studies, highly speculative with some computer modeling of what a reconstruction of a, a sort of vocal apparatus might look like or how it may have functioned. But that was about it. And I think ultimately we had to trust our instincts to go with what worked dramatically with the film. But it's always helpful to do the research to find out what is out there, what do we know, but also understand that ultimately it's a work of fiction and what works dramatically takes priority. So I thought it was fun and working with Kathy Turco as a wildlife biologist. And I, you know, by then spent quite a bit of time in the field making wildlife recordings that we had a good 
baseline of what could we turn to that could give us the, the quality of sound that we were looking for that would keep the audience pretty much on the edge of their seats. So it's a combination of, of research, but also following your instincts based on years of having done this kind of work. Mm. Yeah, and also the story, as you said, because, you know, you had to reveal a certain kind of drama, you know, with the sound. Um, exactly. So, um, yeah, so did I get it right that this was your introduction to the profession of sound designer? Or did you th do anything um, of that kind before, uh, you know, this film, Jurassic Park 3? I had done some work. I'd worked with Chris Boys on Dinosaur, just providing sound effects. And I'd worked on um, some independent films and art films prior to that, including a uh, film called Bon Talk Eulogy by Marlon Fuentes that was a fictional recreation of the World's Fair in St. Louis and the sort of display of human beings as ex exhibition. So I'd done some music composition and some sound design but as I said earlier, this was not a career goal. So I, I had dabbled in it, but I think with Jurassic Park 3 and Dinosaur and meeting Chris Boys, it, it opened up a new path in my career that uh, for which I'm very grateful. Hmm. So, and then, you know, when that gate opened, um, you, of course, worked on, you know, many more films that were not only Hollywood blockbusters. Uh, you already, you know, mentioned art house films, and we're going to listen to a piece of music that you composed for one of such films. Doug, what have we just heard? What was the film and what was the intention behind this composition? So something very, very different from what we were just discussing with Jurassic Park 3. This is a film that I just finished this past week uh, by an American filmmaker named Ted Berger. And Ted is a practicing Buddhist and out of college at the ripe age of 23, he learned Mandarin and went to China to seek out um, Buddhist monks in the Southern Highlands at a remote monastery. And we had worked on one film together called One Mind, a Zen pilgrimage. And this is a piece of music that utilizes um, marimba and singing bowls, which are brass bowls that can either be struck or moved um, to make sound by using a stick or that's coated with a piece of felt or something. Kind of like when you run your finger around a piece of crystal that's slightly wet and you get a wonderful singing tone. So we wanted in this film for the music to provide that kind of stillness, quietude, and energy that comes from the spiritual practice of Buddhism. So very, very different, much more contemplative in a very slow moving film. As Ted was fond of reminding me when we worked on One Mind and it's appropriate with the mountain path about his journey to seek out hermit monks and a nun in this Chan Buddhist community. He said, this is not so much a film about Buddhism as it is a Buddhist film. And so that set up a whole set of expectations and a framing for the film that took it in a very different direction from something like Jurassic Park 3, which is basically one long chase scene. 
This is about stillness and the spiritual practice and rigor involved in that. And Ted's journey of discovery as a young man 20 years ago uh, to these community of people who, who welcomed him. I think when you look at the footage, there's a sense of bemusement. How, how did this person find us? And the Chan tradition goes back over a thousand years and is really one of the ways in which Zen found its way to Japan and then to the West. Mm. Great. So has it been released yet? Is it available um, to watch? Not, not yet. We just finished doing the post-production on it. And at this time, it's in the process of being uh, converted for theatrical release. It'll probably run the festival circuit and certainly be made available uh, to educational institutions as well. So we'll keep you posted as that comes together. But it literally is just wrapping up. Mm. Great. Um, so, uh, so as far as I understand, of course, for for Jurassic Park three, you didn't have to travel anywhere for the film because you already had all your recordings with you in your audio library. Um, what about other films? Um, do you need to travel a lot for for this kind of work? It depends on what my role is, and I think for people listening, uh, you know, the most exciting work is when. You can be involved from the very beginning and be involved in the location recording. And sometimes, you know, I do that. I worked on a documentary about Antarctica called Under Antarctic Ice for the American series Nature on public television. And for that, I was part of the film crew that went to Antarctica and did location recording and dialogue recording. But with um, Jurassic Park 3 and with uh, The Mountain Path, I was not involved in the production, but rather worked with the material that had been gathered by others to work out the design, to do whatever cleanup needed to be done, to conform the audio, and um, in the case of The Mountain Path, work on the music composition as well as the editing, and then what's called the re-recording mix, which is where you pull all those sound elements of dialogue, music, sound effects, and ambiences together into one cohesive soundtrack for the film. So I think it, it depends on film to film, the degree of my involvement. Um, and again, it's exciting when you can be involved from the very beginning to the very last. But it's not uncommon that you have a very specific role in something like Jurassic Park 3, which was a huge Hollywood production budget, my role was very, very much defined within the sound design team. So I never met the director, I never met the actors, I never met the people involved in the music. Really, it was very, very focused. And um, so, which is fine. They're just different scales of involvement depending on the film. With something like The Mountain Path, is basically Ted, me, and a couple of other people involved in post-production. So becomes scalable. And I think for people getting into this, you know, having a broad skill set to be able to get location recording is really important, but also understanding the workflow and the process of what needs to be done at every step so that at the end of it, you have something that you can share with people that, that, that's of a high quality. Mm. So, okay, so about these people who might be thinking, listening to you and thinking, oh, you know, I want to make dinosaurs speak, you know, I want to make dinosaur sounds and get money for that. That sounds like fun, you know, and, and also, you know, um, a way to earn a living. What would be your advice or maybe do's and don'ts? So, great question. I think for anyone who's interested in this is learn your craft and learn it well understand not only the technical means of how to record and how to edit and how to mix, but um, understanding the workflow, what goes into the entire process of how a film is made, whether it's a small student production, an independent film, regardless, they're all going to be different, but they're all going to require the same skills at varying degrees. So I think learning the craft on a technical level is absolutely crucial. You need to know how the equipment works to make the right decisions at the right time. Because what often happens in filmmaking is that you don't have a lot of time. And the higher end productions like Jurassic Park 3, what's called the burn rate, which is how much you're spending 
is measured in minutes, not in hours or weeks or days. And when you're looking at a burn rate that, that rapidly goes up to $150 million, you better know what you're doing and you better have answers for problems because uh, the director's not going to have the patience and the crew's not going to have the time to deal with it. So learning the craft is important. Understanding the aesthetic range of possibilities and being able to respond to different types of situations, I think, is also crucial. That comes with experience, but also what you study. You know, don't just study filmmaking. For me, studying natural history, studying animal behavior, all of a sudden gave me an opening into this industry through wildlife and soundscape recording that I probably wouldn't have had otherwise. And so for me, I think because my interests overlap with natural history and those you know, things of animals. I'm one of those people who, as a child, loved animals and dinosaurs. I just never grew out of it. So I've been lucky that I've been able to translate into making a living. And it's giving me a particular angle on filmmaking that, uh, you know, I bring with me not only the expertise of how to work around wildlife and how to deal with extreme environmental conditions in recording, um, but I have this archive developed now over, you know, 35, almost 40 years of working. So I think it's important for people who want to do this kind of work is to figure out that balance of how you get experience, the technical training, but the aesthetic training and the dexterity, if you will, to be able to move from something like One Mind or The Mountain Path, which are very quiet films and have a whole different aesthetic to a, an action feature film. And I think having that kind of flexibility, again, comes through experience and a breadth of experience, as well as the focused attention to learning the craft. Mm. So these are all very valuable um, tips for for the beginners, um, but also maybe not. Two things that you said at the beginning of this episode kind of um, stuck with me. And I think this open door that you mentioned, you know, that you kept your door open um, uh, and then somebody passing by heard your recordings, I think is a nice metaphor because a lot of people or a lot of especially beginners or people who just try to, to kind of dabble into creative um, work, they kind of tr tend to keep their door shut, metaphorically, you know? They're very afraid to share their work. They're, oh my God, it's not finished, or somebody, or so brilliant that somebody is surely to steal it, you know, or whatever, you know? So, so that was one thing. And another thing was actually, you know, when that person who was walking past this open door invited you to come to a gathering that you said yes. And that's also not an immediate reaction of most of the creators, you know, uh, some of them or a bigger part of them, they would say like, oh yeah, I don't know anyone there. And, you know, I don't even know this guy who's asking me. To me, those two metaphors is like a sign of trust in people and, and in your community and your peers and your colleagues. How important is that? And how, was, how important was that in your career and, and, and what, you know, what you learned from that? Well, I think that's a great observation, Easton. And I think uh, on, on several levels, yeah, it's a great operative metaphor. You have to have some sense of focus about where you want your life to go creatively. But you also have to pay attention to what I call your peripheral vision. So I always knew I wanted to do something creative. And this world of sound, you know, years ago was opening up to me with opportunity. But I was always receptive to things that may not have been in my line of sight, but certainly were shimmering at the edges and the periphery. And I think it's important, particularly in creative industries, that you have a sense of purpose, a goal, but to not be too rigid about it, um, to keep, again, come back to honing your craft, looking for opportunities to connect with people, because let's face it, media production is a social uh, endeavor and activity. And you have to connect with people. You know, if you're a painter, you can get by just working by yourself and, you know, having a, an agent or a gallery represent you. But if you're involved in media production or in music, you, you need other people. And that's part of the excitement of it. And yes, it can be a bit daunting at times. I'm, I'm very introverted. So 
That's partly why I end up with wildlife recording. It's not something you do with other people. You do, I spend a lot of time by myself and, you know, out in the woods or wherever it is that I find myself. But I always remind myself that ultimately the, the joy of doing this work is sharing it with others. So it's being open to possibilities by, again, paying attention to that peripheral vision, but also responding. You know, someone sends you an invitation. It's not like I accept everything that comes my way. I think when I was younger, absolutely, because I was still finding my voice, finding out what the world held for me in my sort of creative voice. And, you know, I found that I gravitated to some things more than others. But I think being receptive to both circumstance and people is a huge part of what constitutes success. And for me, it's not necessarily financial success or fame, but the opportunity to engage meaningfully with like minds, with creative people. And sometimes the money's great, other times not so great. So you have to figure out that balance, what's rewarding financially, what's rewarding socially, and provides meaning and shape to your life. So it's, it's always looking at that as something that's constantly being refined and redefined, particularly as you get older, your priorities shift and you know your interests shift a little bit. You just have to be open to it, not be too rigid, yet remain focused. It's a paradox in a way. Mm, yeah, well, paradox of being, you know, in a creative profession. So it seems that your periphery of the vision, now the peripheral vision that you're talking um, about is quite large because you have, you know, you, you wear quite a few hats in this uh, world of sound and music. And um, we are definitely going to come back to you, your wildlife recordings in, in the next episodes. But um uh, that are farther down our series. But in the very next episode, in episode two, we're going to talk more about your music compositions. So dear audience, stay tuned. <laughs>